Hello, I am Brianna Lawrence, the fandom editor over at the Mary Sue. My pronouns are she and her. And with me, I have some of the cast of The Stranger by the Shore. I don't know who wants to go first. I'll go first. I'm David uh, the captain. <laughs> my name's David Wald. Uh, I was the ADR director for the dub of Stranger by the Shore. Um, <laughs> I've been working on on specifically queer anime for a number of years now, so this is uh, another entry onto that field. But my first for Funimation, so um, a day of celebration for all, yay! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my pronouns are he, him, and I'm gay as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm I'm Josh Greeley. I was the voice of Shun for the dub of Stranger by the Shore, and this is, I've also been very fortunate to be a part of several queer anime over the years, uh, like Princess Jellyfish and Yuri on Ice, and this is, this was by far uh, the one that was very personal. So oh, yeah, it was, it was very, this, this whole thing was, this show was really special in a lot of different ways for a lot of, for a lot of different reasons. Josh, what are your pronouns? They, them, sorry. Thank you. Justin Briner, uh, he, him, and I play Mio in the dub. Awesome. My little angel face. Aw. <laughs> it, it was such a great anime. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but we'll get into that. I'm not going to spend the hour talking about how I felt, maybe. But <laughs> we will see. So, first question. Tell us a bit about The Stranger by the Shore and the character you play in it. Well, about Stranger by the Shore, uh, it's a, a lovely little title. It's a 60-minute title, um, uh, an adaptation of a manga. Um, and it concerns the story of Shun and Mio, who uh, meet one another on a sort of remote Okinawan island uh, where Shun, where they both live at the time. Uh, at the beginning of the action of the film, Mio has just lost his mother, and mm -hmm. is feeling things about that. Um, Shun, meanwhile, is living on Okinawa because he's sort of estranged from his immediate family, having come out to them as gay at his wedding. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a rough one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so he is uh, sort of taking shelter at his grandmother's house, who we all call Auntie, because why not? Um, and... Uh, 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 thus the action begins and Shun and Mio meet and go through a, a pretty long process of sort of coming to terms with their feelings about themselves and one another. And, and the ending's pretty happy. Spoiler. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was the director of the thing. I also was the voice of the, uh, very briefly Shun's dad, who we only meet in flashback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, with uh, Stranger, like from Shun's perspective, you know, like Shun, uh, playing Shun was really uh, tapping into that kind of, that loneliness that I think a lot of, and that feeling of isolation that a lot of LGBTQ people go through in their lives. Um, much because of many, many of them, because of the same reasons that Shun did, because mm -hmm. uh family or friends or you know their closest loved ones didn't accept who they were and Shun is, is uh, in the beginning of the show is very much kind of punishing himself too is yeah. is kind of afraid of his own sexuality and is just afraid of hurting Mio I think but he can't but he 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 has that attraction and he has that interest and he just um and he keeps he tries to reach out and then uh at one point you know, Mio initially kind of um, turns him down in a way that r really kind of shakes Shun and reminds him of many instances in the past uh, where uh, he's been afraid to express his feelings. And, you know, in, in that moment, he kind of did and it didn't go well. So uh, for a lot of the show, he's uh, even after Mio kind of... Uh, comes back and, and tells him, you know, hey, I, I have feelings for you too. Uh, Shun is very much against it. He kind of fights against it for a while. And it's, I think, and that is very much fueled by his own internalized homophobia mm -hmm. uh, and the, that, that fear of 
this is like, if Mio goes down this path, he's going to end up just as miserable as me. And so I feel like he's kind of protecting him in, in those moments, but then stuff starts to change for. Yeah. <laughs> um, as for Mio, unfortunately, when we first meet him, it is fresh off of the, uh, the death of his mother, who we find that he's extremely close to, and that is was his last surviving parent. Uh, so we, we find him in a very forlorn place. He's dealing with uh, basically losing his parents as a child has, has taken his last shred of, of personal agency. Now he, he feels he has no choice in, in where his life is headed, at least in the immediate future. Um, but he meets Shun, and they, they get off to a rocky start, but meeting him sort of sparks this feeling of, of uh, choice and understanding. And, and uh, after a certain amount of time passes, he is able to use that to, to move forward, come back to this, uh, this location that he grew up in, and sort of live with agency and power again. I agree with, with all of that as someone who has watched a movie twice. Um, the stuff with the, uh, well, the stuff with Shun hit really, really personally. Like, I, my wife's parents were the exact same way. And, and she doesn't mind me sharing that because we actually don't talk to them anymore. But that part where, like, the parents are, like, very, like, against his sexuality. But my wife tells the story and she's like, my parents sent me to therapy when I was coming out and they actually don't remember that they did it, but she does. And so like, they, they've completely forgotten, but she's like, I remember their exact words were, no, you're not. Like, you're not queer at all. And they sent her to therapy and they've forgotten the therapy completely. And then, so she like, was like, fine, I'm not. And then we met and then she was out by then. And then I went through the whole, like, I can't be like queer I can't there's no possible way and then after a while I'm like okay I am <laughs> like I, I need to be with this person and we've been together uh 20 years this October so it's like congratulations thank you <laughs> but we, that's we, amazing th thank you so much and, and like that that part we were watching it together and when his dad was saying those words we were like Yep. <laughs> like we both kind of looked at each other. We're like, yeah, I know what yeah. this feels like. This this is the this is the really sucky part. But then what I love about the movie is that it goes past that sucky part to get to like the good part. And I'm like, and that's where we are now. So yeah. that, that felt really special when, when we were watching it together. Good. Um, second question. While we're while there were a lot of moments that hit me where it hurts, as I already said. <laughs> There were a lot of sweet moments and even funny moments throughout the story. Uh, for example, I said on Twitter that Shun channels my energy as a writer, to which I also said that I didn't like Mio calling him out for not having this writing. Time right. Time. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like, "How dare you, sir?" Like, no, don't don't do that to us writers, please. Um, don't, don't you know the struggle of the writer I, and the muse? There's like there's like the part where Mio's like, "Isn't that dude? To, when was that dude?" And he says like, "Yesterday," and I'm like, "Yep." <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> I also adore, I also adore, uh, Mio constantly pouting at Shun for being so Shun. <laughs> uh, what are some of your favorite moments in the movie? Any moment with Morgan Garrett picking on Shun, with Morgan Garrett <laughs> picking on Shun, uh, is a gem of a moment. Uh, I adore Laura, like, and she, she just, she has such a great brat vibe yeah. but like he also was such a supportive al like being queer herself but she was also a yeah. really supportive ally to Shun and Mio um and uh I think my favorite moment in the film is right after Shun and Mio have their first kiss in the in the hotel room and they're just laying on the bed talking, talking? And yeah. you can tell that it's the first truly unguarded moment between the two of them just being being gay and happy together just mm -hmm. being there with each other and it was awesome like it i, I love that scene because you you can feel shun's relief yeah like his his openness in that moment and it's the, it's real that's a huge moment for him the quiet moments in the anime are really great where it's just like two people existing and being themselves and they're just chatting 
Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that, those are the nice moments. <laughs> it's actually the, the quiet moments are literally, I think, most of the film's power. It's mm -hmm. it, 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 in tone. It reminds me a great deal of a, of a, of a title that I previously directed down in Houston, which was Kase San and Morning Glories. And uh, which was similar as, a, uh, as I recall, a one hour film uh, that told a story of two young girls together. Oh, okay. um, and it's, it's really lovely. And just like Stranger by the Shore, it, the silence is one of its greatest tools. You know, um, uh, the environmental sounds in Stranger by the Shore, I think are really lovely. And as a matter of fact, I really kind of think of the island itself as the third character, the third main oh. character. Um, and I think you, you know, you hear the sound of those waves that, that, that character makes themselves known in some really key important moments. And of course, visually, you know, the rendering of the island is just breathtaking. Beautiful, some yeah. of the scenery is just yeah. breathtaking. And which is, I, I think, lends a sense of irony to the fact that, that, that Shun is in the midst of this personal, uh, you know, identity crisis amidst the most... Uh, uh, you know the greatest paradise you can imagine you know this beautiful wash of color and comfort you know um so the uh, yeah i think uh, i think the silence and the things the things that aren't said are some of the most powerful things in the narrative i think some of my some of my favorite moments are i mean the moment josh describes is absolutely one of them those those moments of quiet dialogue i also love uh the family dinner yeah uh, when Mio first sits down <laughs> with the family and it's just this chaos of adoration and <laughs> jabs and very family you know what i mean like yeah which i thought was a beautiful illustration of how successfully though he didn't realize it at the time how successful shun had been at finding a family you know mm -hmm. there's an old um armistead maupin quote uh which says that uh there comes a time when we must rejoin the diaspora to move beyond our biological families to find our logical ones, the, the ones yeah. that make sense for us. Especially in this community. <laughs> that was... Yeah. And just, like, the fact that they got to have that family moment. And it's so, like, it's sweet and it's so mm. comfortable. And, you know, they're arguing about the food. And, yeah. like, even, like, the part when, like, Shun and Mio are together and then the first thing Mio does is, like, eat. Like he's eating food and he's like, Do you want some? And I'm like, Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and he's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. No, you can have all of it. And he's like, Sweet, I'm gonna eat. And I'm like, yeah. Oh my god, that's just but that's what we do. Like, we're like, yeah. All right, we're comfortable, so we're just gonna like lay here and be comfortable and yeah, eat together. And, and, and that too, yeah. like the um, the very end of the thing, after you know, it's there's the sequence where Shun and Mio finally find their comfort in one another's arms. And this is a sequence that could have been that, you know, they could have taken a very prurient approach. They could have made it very visceral and sort of this carnal moment. But instead, what this film shows us is two lovers entering this new territory and like checking in with one yes! another, making oh sure they're okay, <laughs> making sure everyone's still you know, like uh, that to me is one of the most extraordinary elements of this film is that it, yeah. it it doesn't just show us these two boys finding and recognizing the love and then going it's what i always wanted credits roll like <laughs> the beginning of the the complications of navigating such a relationship and these boys it's like they read the manual you know um it's just like that to me is extremely powerful that's a very powerful moment in this storytelling. I, I agree. And just like my wife and I pointed that out, they're like, they're actually asking each other questions. Yeah. Like, like, have you done this? No. Have you? No. Okay. And they're like actually having a conversation. And I'm like, I'm more, I'm very into the conversation they're having right now. Yeah. And during like yeah. such an intimate moment and they're actually talking yeah. the whole time. And yeah. I'm like, wow, that's, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. Staying connected, you know? Yeah. Beautiful. Justin, Justin favorite any? moments? <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my mind went to that same family dinner. I just thought it, it's so sweet uh, because Mio is fresh off the heels of a pretty brutal loss. And when you're coping with that and, and your life feels like the, it's just tragedy all around, it can be difficult to take stock of 
things that you have or things that maybe you don't know that you have yet. Uh, so him getting to have this new found family with people uh, that he's getting to know and, and eventually will come to love is really, it's just really sweet. I, I love, uh, I just, I love the support that, that comes from uh, this little sort of outcast boy who, uh, who really needs something like this, who really needs some company and, and someone, people to understand him, uh, whether he kind of knows it or not. So that, that really, you know, chaotic, but also sweet family dinner where he's, he's like, yeah, I used to cook. I love curry. Uh, these are the things that will keep him grounded. That will keep him Neo for the years to come. I almost like died laughing when it showed the flashback of his mom, like giving him crab. And it was like crap with a K. <laughs> and I was like, God, that feels like my family. <laughs> and, and it was just such just it's like, this is so good, crap with a K. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then you see him eating curry again. And I'm like, oh my God. It, all of those just little moments peppered throughout the story were fantastic. Yeah. But I was like, Brittany I relate Karbowski. to. It was our, Brittany Karbowski is as Mio's mom in flashback, which I really loved i really thought that was novel because usually when we hear britney she's the kid right yeah um and i wanted us to think of mio's mom as having died tragically young like you know that's what i so thought I yeah wanted to keep a very bright and and effervescent actor in that role and and britney just britney didn't realize it but she was playing my mom oh. um, <laughs> she didn't know it at the time i don't know if she does yet if you're watching Britney, well, if Britney's watching, then um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Britney was playing my mom, and like I was, uh, I was doing a lot of choking in those sessions. Um, oh. she's just such a bright light. But interestingly, you know, we have um, uh, these are the little games I like to play with myself in shows like this. Uh, we have Britney, and it was uh, a young, uh, young Mio was an actor by the name of Steph Garrett, and there's a sequence in the film where Mio is with Shun on the beach and they see a young, they see a mother and son playing on the, on the yeah, beach. Yeah, and Mio's that. clearly like the show's not, the, the film isn't like handing, isn't spoon feeding it to us, but Mio's clearly having a moment of thought about his own mom. Well, in that sequence, the mom and son on the beach are Brittany as the kid and Steph. Oh, mom. come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that they would have that sort of the ring of the familiar, a little bit oh. of familiar <laughs> music in there for the audience to notice or not, you know. Wow. Well, thanks for that information. <laughs> I'm, like, I, Inside I, scoop. Oh my God. Like, it here first. I, I'm a very emotional person. So I'm like, oh man. Oh. <laughs> Giving um, you the skills. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing did, honestly. Mm -hmm. And like, and I was like, I get to interview part of the cast, which will lead to more feels inevitably, but that, that's okay. <laughs> uh, for David, you got this question on Twitter, but I want to mention it again because I think you have such a great answer. Uh, as a queer person, how hard was it to deliver lines that centered around homophobia? Oh, the yeah, the sh yeah. Shun's dad. We, we, we see in flashback in the film of one of those traumatic memories of Shun's where he's just actually come out to his family at his wedding and his father and mother are having their reaction to it, which isn't good. Um, and leads to their estrangement. So uh, yeah, the, uh, it was a short sequence. It was just a bit we got to hear from the father and really almost everything we heard from the father in that film, but for one other short flashback was pretty, uh, uh, pretty ragey. Um, and for me, uh, I, I voiced that myself for a couple of reasons. One being that it was going to be really hard for anyone to come in and inhabit that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to be difficult to ask an actor, you know, these are my, my peers and my friends who know me and know what this material means to me. And I'm asking them to come in and be a raging homophobe in this, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very tall order. And, uh, um, so that was one thing. I, I didn't want to ask an, ask an actor to have to navigate that territory under such duress, you know, because there are very few of us who actually feel these feelings, right? None yeah. that I know. Um, but uh, uh, the other reason was because I, f 
I felt like to hear those lines coming from my mouth as someone who was sort of on the other side of that equation. Now, you know, to be clear, my parents, uh, who are both uh, dead now, but, but my parents were nothing but supportive um, in the way they could be, but they never rejected me for my lifestyle or bored judgment. I had other members of my family who did, but not my parents. So that relationship of Shun's father to his son is not a reflection of what mine was in life, but I've spent a lifetime hearing those arguments. So mm -hmm. to me, it seems that a queer person's memory of, 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 of an altercation like that is very acute and, and very specific. And hearing those lines coming from me, you know, from a, from a queer actor and whether or not people know that who I am or that I'm voicing the role or that I've, I'm an, an out queer actor in the industry, none of that matters. It's, it's the, the way that that knowledge of how those lines feel, of how those yeah. words feel to the other side gives it kind of can weaponize those lines a little more and make the audience's experience of them just as acute and just as specific hopefully all on like sort of all in the undercurrents all in the in the subliminal but um i felt it would be a really powerful way to sort of let that father be as traumatic a figure as he needed to be in shun's recollection it worked like I, I felt those. My mom and mom. I'm, oh my sorry. Gosh. My, I'm sorry. My my wife said too. Like my my mother is the most supportive person in the universe. But my dad and I fought. Like when I came out, we actually had like a yelling match when I was in college. Yeah. And so when I heard that, I was like, Oh God! I I think I like went back to my twenties. <laughs> like like Oh, I remember what this is like, and it's not yeah. it's not good. But but then yeah. I saw the tweet and I was like, oh, David did that. Oh my God. As, but you could tell, like, yeah. this is someone who has heard this before. Yeah. And that it's like. So yes, it brought out in your girlfriend a very acute and specific Yeah, she, memory. I like looked at her and I could see that she was tearing up because yeah. it's like, we, we've had, like her parents are out of our life forever for a reason. And she's like, I remember this. And I'm like, I remember this with my dad. And we were just like, but we're not there anymore. But for a moment we were there. And I was tell like. Tell her I love her. Give her an extra <laughs> She'll watch this. She'll see it. And like, funnily enough, my mom will watch it too, even though she doesn't watch anime. She so supports everything I do. Period. So she'll she'll be like, "Oh yeah, I remember that fight with your dad." Because my dad, yeah. my mom was the one who talked them out of it. Like, yeah. she mm. she yelled back, and I'm like, "Okay, thank you." So that that part alone, I was like, I knew it was building up to it, and I kind of love how the anime took its time to get to like that ultimate part. Mm -hmm. And but when it hit, I was like, "Oh, this is why Shun feels this way," and I, I get it. I understand now. So that you did a really good job. And thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this leads to Josh. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, for Josh, what was it like playing a character who was so traumatized by those words that he was still being affected by them, even if he was living in a place where he was surrounded by supportive people? And the atmosphere, as we talked about earlier, because it was such a beautiful setting as well. Um, very real. Uh, sorry. I, I, I knew this would happen. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, when I wrote the review for this, I felt that everything um, going in for Shun, for real, I did. I like... Uh, like David, my my uh, parents' reaction to me and my little brother being queer in, in our respective ways uh, was met with a lot more support than it was with the opposite. Uh, my dad took a little bit longer and had his issues and we had our fights. But for the most part, it was, you know, it, it was as best as it could have been. Um, but... I also grew up hearing, you know, living in Texas and living in the South, hearing those things from a lot of other sources around me, whether it was other kids' parents, other kids themselves, teachers, uh, just, just adults in general, yeah. uh, people at church. Um, th these messages, the, this, this idea of this thing being ro inherently wrong and on some level morally reprehensible was the constant message and 
it's really hard to fight that internally. Um, especially, um, actually, David and I were kind of talking about something like this this morning, and he had a great way of putting it, that it, it, you wake up every day kind of feeling like every day is a, is a battle, is a, like you're in the middle of a war. Because and there's bombs going off, you know, and, you know, and every like, oh, today some politician just said that, you know, uh, oh, publicly God, yeah. that, that <laughs> today some politician just publicly said that uh, all all homosexuals should be, you know, uh, should go through shock therapy or some uh, something ridiculous and regressive and backwards and and or little things like that here and there or or, or something as as kids who don't understand that what they're saying or even friends or people who don't understand that the things that they are saying are inherently harmful and there, and it's really hard to fight against that on, uh, on an internal scale, let alone, you know, being against it public, like fighting against it publicly and saying, no, I have a right to exist. And Shun chose, I think what a lot of us do, which is to go and find his place of comfort and to hide and to, um, to separate himself from that, that environment as much as he could. But even with that separation, he carried it with him. Like those voices and those things that he had heard his entire life still echoed inside of him daily. Um, so like, I, I feel like Shun is a very good, especially in the first part of the movie, is a very good example of exactly what it is like to grow up in either a country like ours or in a, in a country like Japan where these very traditional mindsets are very prevalent, um, that it can be a very isolating and lonely and hurtful experience to, to grow up as a queer person. Um, uh, yeah, I think that Chun was a shining example of that and uh, it was pretty real. Wow, okay, I, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I... Because, like, when I wrote my review, and I was not expecting that element of the movie at all. So when mm. we were watching it, and I was like, oh, my God. Because, like, Shun's surrounded by other queer people who are happy. And, like, I didn't know, I didn't know those characters were going to be there either. And, like, this beach is beautiful. And still, he's asking things like, is this not gross to you, like, being with me? And I'm like, this is a good showing of, it. like, if those messages are still in your head and still something that you deal with, it doesn't matter how beautiful the setting is, it's still gonna affect you. So when he finally got to like discuss this with someone else and let it out, that's when like it started to feel like, okay, now this is really beautiful now. But like in the moment, it's like, it doesn't matter. Like, like I've had moments with my wife who I love to death, but if the rest of the world feels like it's turning against me, it doesn't matter that she's sitting next to me. Cause I'm like in my head, and I'm like, everybody is like against me and I don't know what to do. And then like, I think you're right. He shows that beautifully because he had like, there's like a queer couple in the house. The family dinner is nice. The beach is beautiful. Mio's there. And he's still asking questions like, are you sure you want to be with me? I'm a guy. And it's like, it doesn't matter how he had all of the support in the world, but he couldn't see it. Not right away, at least. And like, eventually he did see it, which was wonderful. Well, and which like, tends to lead one to feel unworthy, you know, yeah, this sort of exactly. imposed emotional distance makes Shun feel unworthy of the love that this boy is offering to him on a silver platter, yeah. gift wrapped. And right? he's got other people telling him it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he, 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 and in a way he starts to repeat, he starts to kind of try to put in his own way he puts those doubts into Mio he try he's trying to make Mio see the same yeah. things that he's feeling and, and like in a way that's that's the trauma perpetuating itself and and being passed on to someone else but Mio fights back and says no yes. this is who I am accept it or not <laughs> tell me give me an that's answer that's the and like he's like Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. By, like that's the wake up call, right? We there. were like, Mio that's is perfect for moment. this boy. Mio is perfect for him because Mio's like, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which this is beautiful. God grant us all a Mio. No, God. oh man, I almost like, I was like, 
Wait, this is this is my interview. I could swear if I want. I was like, no fucking kidding. Everybody needs a Mio in their life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ours is Justin. Thank you, oh, Justin. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to now that I'm like my eyes are no longer watering after Josh's response. <laughs> um, Sorry. Don't apologize. Like I already knew like this was gonna be an emotional interview considering the content. And I'm like, I was ready for it this morning. Uh, for Justin. Uh, your character not only had to deal with his own feelings, uh, both romantically and dealing with the feelings of loneliness after the death of his mother, but he had to deal with Shun's. Uh, how did you juggle both Mio's feelings and Shun being so hurt by what happened to him in the past? Um, uh, my dear Mio, uh, our dear Mio, um, has a big, big heart. Um, that has been hurt very, very deeply by, you know, things out of his control. Um, and I think the struggle to communicate with Shun uh, really weighs heavy on him at first. You know, if he's anything like me, you'll have that bad, you know, that bad communication and you'll stay up at night thinking about like, what went wrong? What was I not getting? Did, did I do something wrong? I don't know. Mm. Um, and... It, I think it's great to see that he's grown into such a, a fine young man, despite all the odds, but still he being so certain of how he feels is at odds with uh, Shun's, you know, misguided sort of protection. Uh, he doesn't want Mio to be hurt. And Mio, uh, I love him for this. He's he's not afraid anymore to be hurt uh, it, because he knows how, how he's been through it. And, and if it's, if it ends up cruddy, then so be it. But if there's a glimmer of hope to chase, then why not go for it? You know, uh, life is fleeting and, uh, having to, you know, having to deal with that, it, it, it he's such a, a beautiful character. Um, and, you know, I, I think we all may know someone in our lives who inadvertently or not assumes the burdens of those around him, uh, so, and Shun definitely has some, <laughs> some pain to provide, but uh, they work through it. And, and uh, we spoke about this earlier, they communicate. It's not always easy, and it never is, uh, but they get through it and they keep talking and keep uh, understanding each other in a deeper and deeper way as we see progressing throughout the movie. And it's, it's just really, it's really sweet. You don't get, uh, you know, Anime can be a little larger than life at times, and in this, it's, it just feels so real. It feels like two men trying to navigate stormy waters, and they're going to get there. It's not going to be easy, but they are going to get there. I love that. I love that so much. and It's very true. Like, Mia was just the perfect person that Shun needed in his life, and, and vice versa, really. Yeah. Like, they both need each other, and the anime illustrates that very well. So, bless Mio. Bless Mio's heart. <laughs> uh, for Josh and Justin, uh, from my understanding, voice actors aren't together in the booth during doing scenes together. A is that right? I, I have no idea if that's right or not. I was just guessing. <laughs> um, yeah, that was true. Generally. Okay. Uh, if that's the case, what was it like doing such intimate scenes together when you aren't sharing the same space? Well, Justin's such a good looking man. I just had, to, <laughs> you know, yeah. I just, uh, but, uh, uh, it, D David actually helped me out very much in, in these scenes. He was a great, he was a great guide, uh, in terms of, um, he taught me a couple of tricks on the microphone that I hadn't known that I, I had never used before the, to kind of help get the, the, that sounds that very intimate sound, especially when two people are kissing, um, and to make it sound as real as possible. But for the rest of it, it was just, putting myself and that's like it was I was I'm you know just you know imagining yourself with the person that you love the most first and kissing them for the first time especially after you know just, you just put yourself in that situation and that's that's what it was like uh throughout all of it the kissing and then ultimately their their very intimate moment at the end of the film and even like their conversations I imagine too like when they're just laying together when and they're talking. just sitting there on the yeah, yeah. Just sitting there and talking like you just you, putting yourself in this place that that mindset of 
I'm finally getting to be free with this other person. I, I get to be my whole self now with, because of this other person. And I get to share that with someone and like that, that was, yeah, that's what, that's what it's like, at least for me. Y'all making me feel feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the same for you as well, Justin? Absolutely. I mean, going into this, I knew it would be a, a space of trust and respect. Um, and I've, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, opposite Josh in, in a few projects by now. And I know that Josh is a beautiful actor. And uh, I can hear some of that in my head, even if uh, the lines aren't placed yet. I, I, I know that there's going to be great care. And with David at, a, at the helm, uh, navigating me, you know, it just felt, you know, safe to explore these feelings and to, to have them be as honest as possible. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of strange that uh, even though I am in that booth all by myself, uh, I have a sense of what's supposed to be there, what will be there. And... Uh, David helped me fill in whatever blanks were left. And from there, you just, you, as, as Josh said, you try to find the truth. And uh, all these, you know, the beginning leading up to these, these really intimate moments, we've had that foundation built. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when, when it was time to, to be a part of that scene, it, it really just, it started to fall right into place, I think. Yeah. Bree, what's, you know, really of benefit to us in this particular business that we do in this business of anime dubs is that unlike most on-screen stuff, um, and even unlike a lot of rehearsal periods for a, for a stage production, when we do this work, we generally do it in sequence, right? Okay. So the actors are recording these scenes in the order in which they happen. Of course, on TV, that's almost never the case. Uh, in, mm. in rehearsing a play, you'll rehearse. Uh, tonight, we're just working on act two, scene one, and act three, you know, three, scene four. Y you know, so you get things sort of out of sequence and disjointed, which, which contributes to your understanding of the overall piece in a long-term project like that. But in this, the business of anime ADR, um, we generally go in sequence. So that's of great benefit to actors. Yeah, I would imagine because it was space. building up to... Yeah, you get yeah. the whole narrative leading up to that moment, which is essential. It's, you know, that understanding is essential in order to give them the weight that you can hear in the finished product. That's awesome. I, like, I know nothing about voice acting, so I was just curious about, like, Neither you guys are we. in separate booths, <laughs> but, like doing these very emotional scenes but somebody's recording here and somebody's recording here how do you like marry the two together well but, you know the boys won't tell you this but really that's <laughs> just that's just one of the things that great actors can do you know put themselves in that moment and and feel themselves in that moment and communicate in that moment that's the difference between a great actor and someone who's not an actor Right. And, and these are two of the best. <laughs> ah, David's, David's uh, pumping you guys up for good reason. Well, and <laughs> here's the thing, though, but like, in, like Justin said, it not only getting to work a, 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 across from not only an actor that you know, like in the case of Justin, I've worked with him on a, several shows. Like, we also got to do Stars Align together. Um, we've been in a couple of other things. In, Wait, you know, who the, are you in Stars Align, Josh? Who are you? I'm, I'm the glasses kid. <gasps> yeah, the one that. No, <laughs> Yeah. I love that anime so much. Oh, really? A dot is Oh, my gosh. Yes. Oh, what? This happened in the last LGBTQ like, interview. I, I have another Stars Align actor night. I fan yeah. girl, because uh, that's one of my favorites is Stars Align, which I, it's in one of the questions coming up, but oh, my God. Uh, that show went places. And it how was, could you not tell I'm me surprised. you were Stars Align? I, I feel betrayed. Yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah, like getting to work a so across from an actor like Justin that I like is not only immensely talented and knows how to handle and, and just knows how to approach a character honestly. Like you not only do you feel like as an actor going into a situation like that, not only do you feel much safer and like he was saying, like there's a, you know that there's going to, that the person across from you is going to be handling it with respect and, and focus like, and not just, you know, brushing it off. Um, but there's also the benefit of having a director like David, 
who has also been a fucking great actor his entire life, who has also been through these experiences to guide us. Like, this dude is mm, the conductor yeah. of this orchestra, and he does it masterfully. And, like, we felt, like, I, I'm not going to speak for Justin, but, like, I, I felt so comfortable throughout the entire, like, I was nervous about a few things. David and I, you know, and he, David helped me through it. But, like, for the most part, it was one of the most comfortable instances that I have ever had oh, being an actor, either on stage or in the booth. And it's because of, it's because of David. And it's because of getting to work with David and because of working across from someone like Justin and Morgan Garrett and Jessica Kavanaugh and Brittany Karbowski, like these people that are rock solid in every aspect. Like it, it was just the, it was the perfect ensemble. That's beautiful. And that's David's. That's David's doing. <laughs> Not get on Josh with you, beautiful bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, you weren't gonna say it yourself, so I had to. Right. Somebody has to, to give David. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! Well, this leads perfectly to my next question. Um, how does working on *The Stranger by the Shore*, a story where the queer experience is such a major focus that is advertised as a queer story? differ from working on series like Yuri on Ice for Josh and Stars Align for Justin and I guess Stars Align for Josh uh, as well because I didn't know that. <laughs> um, two Josh series, is in everything. I, I should have known. <laughs> two series that both have queer elements in them but aren't necessarily the main focus of the plot. It was definitely a breath of fresh air. It was kind of a relief to see that there wasn't anything being hidden behind inference or metaphor that it was just, Hey, this is a queer story. And this is the queer experience. Like, boom. It's right. <laughs> there. Like, instead of, you know, like Yuri, um, Yuri had a lot of really incredibly progressive scenes for what was a mainstream anime at the time, mm -hmm. but there was definitely some stuff that because of, the kind of place that Japan is um, that they had to kind of slide under the radar and, and, and present the show completely as just a sports, like coming of age and, and, and a, um, an artist regaining the love for their art story, you know, that sort of thing, but, but through sports, but like to ever, like for most of us watching it, it was a queer story. Yeah. And it, it, like, and as much as, as, as much as that element was there, it was also very carefully crafted to be hidden. And that kind of hurts after a while, you know? And so it was really cool to get to be a part of a show that where this was the focus, this is what we're talking about. No, there's no inference. Nothing is hidden. It's just, this is it. It's so pretty what, gay right out the gate. I mean, like the trailer, yeah. he's like, I like you. And I was like, wow, it's just right in the trailer. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, do you no feel illusions. similar? Sim uh, oh. Similar way of that. <laughs> Can't talk. Oh, definitely. And, and anime has, in general, made large progressive strides over the past few years. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, and to the frustration of, I think, many marginalized fans, it, is, it's, it tends to be subtext. And fandom, in general, is a really beautiful thing because once once the work is out there, it's for the fans to enjoy and extrapolate and decode their own ways. And uh, there's a lot of, of, of fun to be had in, in understanding how these characters interact in, in different scenarios, making your own up and, and seeing how they, how they participate in, in your mind. Um, but as, as has been said, this is... This is flat out cards on the table, a queer love story. And there's examples of it, not just between Neo and Shun, but this is a world in which uh, queer love can blossom. Uh, so yeah, if, if this is an indication of the stories that are yet to come and haven't been told yet, then I, I just think it's going to be a really remarkable thing. I agree. Yeah. I agree with all that. 
myself, I mean, I'll tell you the importance of these titles to me is that that I grew up in a time where I didn't have uh, any animated queer stories to watch. I, I didn't see queer people depicted in, in film unless they were generally psychopaths or vagrants or comic relief, you know, like I went through an entire, there was a dearth of this stuff in, in the, in storytelling of my youth. And, um, you know, I, I, ultimately the big point for me is that even today, even right now, queer kids tend to commit suicide at a rate about 30% higher than their straight counterparts. And I think what they're dying of is a sense of, of solitude and alienation. And I think the perhaps the best tool we have in the kit to ease that pain is in our storytelling. Yeah. Uh, and particularly in this particular medium, the medium of anime, because anime has been telling pretty queer stories for a really long time. And we mostly avoid them in the West. We dance around them. Small pockets of people know about these stories. And some of them are very problematic. Some of them aren't great examples. I think they can still be useful. Um, and I think uh, something like Yuri on Ice, I mean, I, in the, in the grander sense, I absolutely agree with Josh that like, it seemed like it was pulling those punches and maybe capitalizing on them a bit. But I'll tell you, Yuri on Ice handed us a revolution. And the revolution in Japan was that by inferring all this career material, they were able to be in a, in a prime time afternoon time slot. Yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. if it had been known that this was a queer story and if it had been highlighted and pointed at and the camera had focused on it, it would not have enjoyed that place. And so because of yeah. that, it, it, you know, what, what Yuri on Ice was to Japan's media was sort of what Will and Grace was to ours in the 90s. Not the greatest examples of queer representation by a long shot, but queer people in your living room for the first time, you know, yes. hello, mm -hmm. Japan, here are the ice skaters you love and adore. And also, you know, probably a little queer. The show seems to kind of be bending that way. But then what came after Yuri on Ice was the establishment of Blue Lynx, the uh, Stranger by the Shore, Bloom Into You, Given, you know, titles which are telling really integral, uniquely queer stories. And I think more of that is coming because now even Japan sees the validity of, of the queer demographic, of the audience that's there to, to consume that stuff. And I think the same is true in the West. I think we're at a slightly different stage of it. You know, a Yuri on Ice for us hits a little different. We're a little savvier to the presence mm -hmm. of the queer person in, in our media. But uh, uh, still, I felt empowered watching it. Yeah. Um, I, felt rep I felt a little seen watching it i feel like i can be more seen and i think that's ultimately what my brothers and sisters in the rainbow tribe need is to feel seen to feel heard to feel that there are people of themselves who are out there in a medium trying to sing them a song of themselves rather than having to project their their romantic predilections on the straight leading couple and think oh she's sort of like me he's sort of like my boyfriend having to dig for examples, yeah. for songs of themselves, hearing it sung from a mountaintop. And I think um, um, Yuri on Ice got really close to that. But I think Stranger on the Shore is an even clearer, sharper song. And it's, it's you know, it's unabashedly, unapologetically, uh, unmysteriously queer. Yeah. And I feel like also the message was like, what we want is very simple. Like we just want acceptance and love and to be comfortable around other people like that well, that was the, the end goal <laughs> that was yeah. the end goal of the, the anime it was like I just want to feel comfortable and then yeah. they feel comfortable and and I, I tell people a lot it's like I feel like people think it's this grand giant thing that we want when at the end of the day it's like no nah, I just kind of want to exist <laughs> and exist freely without yeah. being worried about what someone might do to me for existing but yeah and, and the fact Shun has a quote and addresses this directly. He says, yeah. um, uh, what makes us all so afraid of two men or two women yeah. being together? All the things in this world that we could fear and we pick love. Right, <laughs> exactly. Only humans, yeah. right? Exactly. It's like, that's that's all we want. And they just walk away together. And it's like, I just want to be here and live my life. And, and that's pretty much it. And 
I feel like the more anime and just series in general that tell these stories, people can see like, oh, I guess it's not actually that difficult. It's like, no, not really. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. just like where people exist and, and then it, that'll be it. That, that's fine. <laughs> so final Amen. question. Uh, as someone who has been watching anime for many years, <laughs> I know that queer anime doesn't always get released here. And when it does, it doesn't always get things like a dub version and isn't always promoted as much as other anime. The Stranger by the Shore is one of the few exceptions. What would you like to see happen in the future with queer anime? Uh, be it characters in anime who just so happen to be queer or anime stories that are primarily about being queer? Well, I myself would like to see m a lot more characters that happen to be queer rather yeah. than being the queer one and their only contribution to the narrative being that they're the queer one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would like to see more of that happening to be queer. I'd like to see uh, Die Hard, you know? I want to see Die Hard and nothing in it is different except he's breaking into Nakatomi Plaza to buy, to, to save his husband, Harry Gennaro. You know yeah. what I mean? That's all yeah. I need. That would I don't be need badass, actually. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, we working on it. But like, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see more authentic queer storytelling, not romanticized and made into soap operas and made into, you know, look at the extravagant and, and atypical lives of queer people. Just a simple story of two queer people finding love in the same ways anyone else does and have it not being a breakthrough. Yeah. Right. That's what I'd like normalization yes i would i would love that so much actually <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah time is coming i think it's inevitable we just gotta we just gotta sing real loud right now is all yeah <laughs> turn, turn the volume up as loud as possible yeah and then and turn then it up to 11 and rock that mother <laughs> uh justin any thoughts um yeah i i mean i think there's a place right now maybe for for uh queer characters to have their big moments and 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 a big reveal and and surprise audiences because generally they're not expecting it right now but i i hope that the the end result is as we've been saying uh, they are who they are you know that is another quality that makes them themselves and and as audiences we can watch and say well of course I've seen that. I, I get it. Mm, uh, it makes perfect yeah. sense. Uh, but in the meantime, I do think that having access to shows such as Stranger by the Shore is is a real light in the darkness for many marginalized folks who just simply they don't have access to these stories and these characters. Uh, I hope that that changes in the future. I dearly do, and I, I think it will. But uh, now, I think making a, a loud and proud statement that there's audiences for these stories and these audi audiences for these characters is going to go a very long way. Agreed. I agree with all of that. Um, I feel the exact same way. And I remember when we were watching it, we were just so surprised by things that I wish wasn't a surprise. Like yeah. we were looking at the rating of the anime and we were like, I can't believe it's not mature rated because there's a, an intimate moment between the characters. And I'm like, I was so ready for it to be like mature rated because that's what I grew up with. Like anything remotely queer and intimate was automatically mature, no matter how like tame it was. But we were like, it's not mature rated. It's dubbed, <laughs> like it's being, talked about online like there's a trailer and they're posting it they're sharing it and I, as someone who went through a period in like the early 2000s looking for as much queer content as I could I had to dig and dig and search and search and like I would find things that's just like really small scale not really talked about you knew about it if you knew like the right guy at the video store you know and it's like now it's like I checked Twitter and I'm like wow like there's there's people like sharing the story and like i didn't even know this anime was coming out and i got an email about it and i was like wait on funimation what <laughs> like as in like like really and, and i actually thought they were kidding i was like no they, they wouldn't they're not gonna and, and they did and i was like oh wow but i'm still kind of 
even if I know that we've made progress, I'm still very much, you know, the 18 year old who was trying to find anything remotely queer and the closest I could come was fandom. Like, oh, people are writing fanfic. That's something. Yeah. Like, that's better than my other options, which was everything David said earlier. It was like, oh, it's a queer story. They both died at the end. Oh, it's a queer story. They're all like super mm -hmm. degenerate evil people. Yeah. And yeah. so like, as the only thing I had, and I even wrote an article, I was like, if it weren't for like the Gundam Wing community, <laughs> For like yeah. the fandom, I would not yeah. have any positive queer stuff. Now it's just us making stuff up. And mm -hmm. I'm like, but we're making progress where it's like, oh, it's not just me reading thick. It's not just me reading someone's headcanon that this character might be gay. It's actually content now. And mm -hmm. I just want more of that and like for it to be more normal. So it's not like like next time I get an email about a stranger by the shore, I don't want to be surprised. I want to be like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> like this this is a thing that is just part of our media now it's it's just here well you may f find it even more heartening to know Bree, that that like it took a huge swath of people to make a title like stranger by the shore happen yeah. it wasn't just i mean over in japan it doesn't was just one person going let's do a thing it was a large team of people who worked on putting that story together every That's one awesome. of them Thanks. queer or no contributing to the authentic telling of an integral queer story and then over here it took uh, Funimation's licensing department going after this title recognizing that it has virtue yeah. and and going after it and that happened without any of our knowledge you know wow. and then yeah. the, the production department of Funimation thinking you know what we know we actually know a queer director maybe that would be a good matchup for a title like this to give it some yeah. the authenticity we hope it 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 deserves so they match me like it, it, there were so many steps on that process and so many people, queer and otherwise, participated in bringing that to life, you know, bringing the stranger to this shore, right? <laughs> so so it, 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 it took a massive effort. It took a massive effort. And they were willing to make the effort, effort, which is amazing, yeah. that they were willing to yeah. do it. Like when, when we saw it was getting dubbed, we were like, I can't think of many queer anime that gets a dub track. I can't. Yeah at all i can maybe yeah. think of maybe two or three in my no. 30 some years of anime yeah. watching it is rare <laughs> and i think largely the reason for that is because i think the industry feels that it's appealing to a small swath of its own crowd mm -hmm. what i what i've been you know screaming down every hallway that will house my face is that the you know somewhere in the single digits maybe one percent or less of the english-speaking population consumes anime on a regular basis meanwhile 20 to 30 percent of the english-speaking population not to mention the global population ascribes to one color or another on, on a rainbow flag so one percent versus up to 30 percent is kind of easy math to me yeah and i think they're starting to recognize that oh this is a way to build bridges into audience even beyond that which we already have. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's anecdotal, but I would, I would venture to say that within the extant anime fandom, perhaps your anecdotal experience is the same. But I would say the, you know, roughly 20 to 30 percent of some kind of queer or another is way off in anime fandom. And I think the anime community being generally more open and accepting and also being a place where those of us who feel like we've grown up on the outside tend to gravitate i'd say it's a way bigger percentage of queer people in yeah. anime fandom and i think it it behooves our industry to go after that audience because no one else is mm, yeah as someone who came out through fandom i wholeheartedly agree like i met my uh, wife through fandom it came out well i came out through fandom and gun, lots of gundam wing fix lot lots of them yeah. <laughs> and like going to like shows and events there are so many queer fans out there in the anime community and and they're just all yeah. here and i remember i told someone like anime conventions was the first place i felt comfortable enough to like say that i'm queer like i would hold her hand we would walk around i would see kids wearing flags as capes and I'm like, okay, this is a safe space. I'm going to tell everybody now. And, then, yeah. And, yeah. and it's just that magical feeling happened at like every event we would go to. So I wholeheartedly um, agree. I think the institution itself, the industry itself, particularly the dubs industry itself, will one day awaken to the yeah. potential of that crowd. But 
for the moment, we just have to make a lot of noise. And yeah. we just have to say, we want our stories. We know they're out there. Bring them to us. Yeah. And we'll support them. And, Get and loud, we'll support them and we'll be loud. And like when this yeah. launched, like launch day, all, my whole timeline was right. for sure. And I'm like, yeah. bless. <laughs> Thank yeah. gosh. I'm so, what is the word? Like honored that I got to do this with you guys. Like, well, as I said, the Thank you. As I said in the last LGBT panel, all of you are people who I hugely respect and like I'd be the girl standing at your table to get autographs. <laughs> and now I get to talk to you about queer anime and I can't fathom that at all. Figure out how to use I just said stop recording, right? And then it saves the video. <laughs> <laughs> no, the Here's hoping. <laughs>